How's it going, everybody? It's Ryan here, going to provide you another information-packed video talking about carbohydrate metabolism. There are five pathways. You guys are actually helping me, or I'm helping others, pass the Precision Nutrition uh, Certification. Here's the book. Got the book right here. And uh, I want to go over the five pathways. I tried to do this before, but I really didn't understand it. Now I somewhat understand it, but it's a bit complicated. Uh, if you've heard other people talk about carbohydrate metabolism, uh, what I tell you will probably help put more of the pieces together because a lot of people say, oh, if you eat carbohydrates, it makes your blood sugar go up, your body produces insulin, and then, then your blood sugar goes down and levels off, and then you have these ups and downs, and carbs make you store fat, insulin makes you fat, everything makes you fat, right? Well, what this, what I'm going to tell you is basically factual stuff that's science, and it's kind of cool because you um, can't argue it, it's stuff that doesn't really change. Uh, but you never know, could change, but unlikely for these things. So let's get into the material. I have my notes right here in front of me. We have five pathways for carbohydrate metabolism. Excuse me, get some water. <clears throat> okay, hopefully I don't sound like a frog. All right, so there are five pathways to carbohydrate metabolism. That uh, the first pathway or the first um, the first process is glycogenesis. Uh, and that simply is the process of turning sugar, glucose, you take carbohydrates in, glucose into glycogen, right? So then the glycogen gets stored in the liver uh, and the muscles to be used for energy. I've always told glycogen is basically like muscle gasoline. And then we have, then the second pathway is glucogenolysis. And what this is, is glycogen back to glucose. So in, in any case that your body needs to find a way to get that glycogen that was just turned from glucose to bring blood sugar back up glycogenolysis kicks in then we have the third process which is glycolysis now glycolysis might sound familiar you might hear someone say there's a lot of glycolytic glycolytic work where you're basically burning your muscles think of uh crossfit's very high gly glycolytic uh i'm butchering that a little bit but like for example like max reps on a like a squat, usually like a ten rep max is typically a very you know very high anaerobic threshold type of stuff for sprinting, is when you're in hitting glycolysis, and that's basically glucose to pyruvate, which I'll elaborate more on later. Then we have the Krebs cycle. This is the fourth one, Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. This is essentially where you get a lot of your steady state cardio going on, and then we have gluconeogenesis, which is the opposite of glycogenesis which is simply like reverse, meaning that instead of turning, uh, ba your body's going to go back and take amino acids and fat, mainly amino acids, and turn them into carbohydrates. That way it can prop up blood sugar. It's actually going to, I think, put it in the liver is what happens. Okay, so let's go into this in detail. Got my notes here. So during uh, glycogenesis, if the demand of glucose is low and if there's extra glucose from carbs ingested, insulin gets stimulated. So this is what happens. And, and, it, and it transfers the sugar, the the carbo, the the glucose into the muscle and the liver as glycogen. If energy demand is high, so let's say you're exercising or you're on low calories um, or you're fasted, your body needs to tap into exe your body needs to tap and needs to tap into existing glycogen stores. Like again, like you're working out, adrenaline kicks in, like norepinephrine and stuff like that. Uh, to stop your body from storing glycogen. It's like, why are you storing? We got to use this stuff. So it's, it's going to stop it. So when you're fasted at low, low on calories or exercising, training hard, uh, carb metabolic pathway shift to glycogenolysis. So this is when the uh, glycogen basically goes back into the bloodstream from glycogen. It's, and just so you know, glycogenesis, gly this is getting a little confusing here. Glycogenolysis, which is the second pathway I mentioned, is simply mean, which means the splitting of glucose. All right. So during fasting or exercise, your body says, let's break up all the glycogen in our muscles and use it. One thing to note is the brain and the blood cells can't store its own glucose. So they rely on the glucose from the last meal. And when that runs out, they tap into the liver from glycogen there. Once glycogen gets stored in the muscles, it can only be stored, it can only be used in the muscles, so it can't take away from the muscles once it's there. Uh, when a person is well-fed energy and energy demand is low, glycogenesis is pretty much your main carb metabolism. That's the first one I mentioned. That's your body. Basically, if you're overweight and you're getting fatter, 
Or if you're not overweight and you're in a caloric maintenance, you are essentially just simply shifting energy around to be used later. Number three, glycolysis. It comes from two main sources. It's from your blood glucose and stored glycogen. Uh, glycolysis is running in high gear if energy demand is high, like a 10 to 20 rep max set, like I told you about, working very close to your, or wor actually working into your anaerobic threshold. Uh, then number four, uh, the Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. When you're, when you're running, like jogging at a mild pace or maybe squatting 135 pounds for some warm-up sets, depends on your body weight, I guess, uh, for a steady state cardio, basically an activity below anaerobic, anaerobic threshold is, is what you use for the Krebs cycle and uh, electron transport chain is typically what you do when you're just like I'm standing here, for instance, right? And I'm not eating. One of the reasons why people feel sluggish, this is actually a pretty interesting note that I wrote down. One of the reasons why people feel sluggish on low carb diets, especially when they first decrease their carbs, they aren't gener regenerating enough ATP through the Krebs cycle. I'm talking this Krebs cycle I'm talking about. Uh, also, the liver doesn't have enough stored glucose to ship out to the brain and red blood cells. This usually happens when you're eating less than 100 grams of carbs a day. As long as you're taking enough fat, you're, you're consistently and you're consistent with low carb for one to two weeks, you'll produce enough ketone bodies to compensate and then you won't feel sluggish anymore. This is what people refer to as fat adapted. It's a, sometimes a rough transition period if you're used to having high amounts of carbohydrates. Number five, the final pathway, which is gluconeogenesis, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is for your central for your central nervous system to, to function optimally, plasma levels of glucose must be sufficient to provide enough energy to the brain. So when it sense, when your body senses that the glucose is low or your sugar is low, carbohydrates are low, it's going to basically make stop letting you use your carbohydrate your glycogen, and it's going to shut it off. And sometimes, depending on your kind of metabolic state, it, it might make you feel very, very tired very soon, or if you're fat adapted, you'll probably be fine. Uh, this is where the brain is protect, protected, and uh, glycogen liver, uh, when liver glycogen is low, so the reason why it's saving it is because, again, the brain can't store its own, so it needs to, your brain sort of has a limitation for like, okay, we need to make sure that our brain gets, we save enough for the brain. Um, it helps control high levels of blood lactate that accompany high intensity activity. Uh, so that's, that's, that's also what the gluconeogenesis do too. So if you're like working really hard, it sort of helps balance your blood sugar, I guess is what this is saying. So there's the five pathways, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, electron and transport chain and gluconeogenesis. I know that was a bit of a mouthful. Uh, let's talk about, you know, applications and the stuff that really makes sense or maybe makes put it all together for you is that for the most part, you know, when we talk about carbs, protein, and fat, calories matter the most when it comes to weight loss. It's not about the necessarily how much fat, carbs, and protein you have. Uh, people will argue this to the cows go home and will say you need to eat healthy whole foods. And for the most part, yes, this is very true, and, I, and I'm a believer in that. I'm just simply saying, what what do you want to argue? You know, if you want to have a, a fight about debate about nutrition, we can. It's we can if you want, but it all depends on the person. It's all very um, person based, you know, people who have trouble with certain foods will overeat foods. And the, the truth and reality is that when you eat high carbohydrate, most people who eat processed high carbohydrate foods, high sugar will have a tendency to just eat more calories. It's not really because the carbs themselves are stopping you from losing weight. Um, that's my current stance. Anyway, people will say that there are people who have been on higher carbs diets that haven't been able to stay on a diet because they think that the carbs are making their insulin levels go high. And I'll, 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 my argument there is pretty much the reason why you're having trouble losing weight on a high carb diet is you're eating more than you think you are. It's very common for people that are very overweight to under report quite a bit and eat more than they realize. So unless you're eating out of a vacuum or in, in like a controlled area or in a box, it's really hard to say really kind of how you're eating uh, for the most part. You can't really, I mean, unless you, like that, that's the reason why bodybuilder diets training for contests or for serious powerlifting meets that need to cut like a ridiculous amount of weight to make sure they, they make weight. They're really focused on following something to a T. There's no cheating uh, because that's how serious their sport is because they really, they're really they very serious about what they're doing. MMA, for instance, is an example of that. And that's why when people miss weight in sports, especially high-level professional sports, they're highly criticized. But then again, you got people like regular people who just work out in the gym who don't rely on their fitness for their livelihood, I mean, they're, I mean, their physical, like high level performance anyway, uh, they don't, 
it's so easy to slip. There's no, you, it doesn't, your life doesn't depend on it. You know, like if you're getting ready for a movie role or something, like you're a famous actor, it's a lot different than if you're just like, even just me, I'm a personal trainer. I need to stay in shape. But to be ripped and shredded, it just isn't within necessarily my job description to, to, to function optimally, you know. But I guess that's an argument within itself too. Uh, but so just understand that these are the five pathways of, of carbohydrate metabolism. I don't know if you got anything from it, but maybe uh, you can better understand science more. Because I mean, people are really interested in nutrition and science. I am too. But then when you really start digging in, like this book, for example, or just any, any science, it gets pretty dry. And then you start to look at it it's like, why am I reading this? And, it, and you want to be interested. You want to be engaged. But the problem is when you read this stuff, there's no direct application, not right away. It makes sense later. You know, I can probably make sense of this stuff. I actually do understand all this stuff. It's just to sort of explain it in a way that's applicable. Let me try. Um, when you eat food, you're in glycogenesis because you're storing glucose, right? Glycogenolysis is when you're starting to actually work out, lift some weights, bench press, 10 reps. And then you decide to do some... Um, I don't know, bench press followed by superset push-ups and bicep curls. That's when glycolysis starts to have to kick in because then you're really starting to build some lactate up. Oh, the one, uh, the one thing I forgot to mention about glycolysis, which is sort of interesting to me, might be interesting to you, is that when you start to burn your body, you, you build this lactate, uh, your body has a way to use that lactate and reuse it to produce more ATP. In case you're not sure what ATP is, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. I can't believe I got that right. I said that right the first time on this video is that what it is it's a it's a the molecule that basically that's what you that's what causes it's basically electricity for the body it's what we measure what they measure for energy and the body for exercise the Krebs cycle electron transport change is sort of what you're doing at low level energy like what I'm doing now standing and talking doing steady state cardio your body's shifting through all these these are almost like all different kinds of gears and some like for example uh, you know, glycogenesis is going, you guys, you're, you're storing glucose and then you start working out. So that's glycogenolysis and glycolysis. Those, those two, those two ones are like basically going back and forth, depending on what you're doing. Let's say you're sprinting. So you're definitely in high glycolysis or more so glycolysis. And then you kind of go back more to glycogenolysis, uh, kind of back and forth. Did I do that right? Yeah. I think, I'm, oh no, actually I'm already confusing everything. Glycogenolysis, glycolysis, and the Krebs cycle. So you're doing those three pathways and then the last one is glyconeogenesis this is essentially what happens when you're like i've always looked at this as your body eating its muscle and i mean you shouldn't really freak out because or maybe you should but i mean if when your body starts to go into gluconeogenesis your body's breaking down amino acids and turning it into sugar so that way it can be used as energy uh not necessarily not necessarily a bad thing as long as you're properly fed and you eat right and you eat the proper nutrients in your body and you're not in a very wide deficit uh, this is kind of why it's very, you can't really gain muscle and lose body fat at the same time if you are a fit, uh, highly adapted person because there's just not enough room. Your body's more concerned about staying alive. When you're a novice, when you're brand new, you can do both. Or let's say you're coming off a layoff, right? You've been worked out for three or four months or maybe even four weeks. You can actually build some muscle and lose some body fat at the same time. But there will come a point as you become consistent with training that you're just not going to be able to do both as optimal you can still get pretty good results it's just understanding that when you're in like a maintenance when you're eating maintenance calories or a little bit above uh you're gonna have, be in a better environment to gain muscle than if you were in a deficit so those are some thoughts hope you enjoyed it thanks for watching leave a comment if you have a question if you have a complicated question i'll try my best to answer it and i'll see you guys on the next video